Watch it! Well, 58 minutes of what the hell did I just watch just happened. Can't say I'm not impressed. The first time I had more answers than questions with this one. Five down, two to go, let's get right into it. So we start off with a pleasant riverside in a seemingly calm nature landscape. The aftermath of the High Garden attack smoldering in the background, looking like something out of Dunkirk. Pop goes the weasel as Braun springs from the water with a seemingly unconscious Jamie gasping for air. Braun berates him, rightfully so, for charging head on towards a friggin' dragon. Then he does his usual Braun thing where he says something that no likable character would ever say but then Braun makes it funny by saying only he gets to kill Jamie when this is all over. Tyrion wanders the scorched battlefield, looking strangely horrified even if he's not on the Lannister side anymore. Even the reigns of Castamere is playing in its typically melancholy fashion in the background. Daenerys brings all the survivors forward all of them covered in a hell of a lot of blood and ash. Of course, she criticizes them for choosing Cersei's side, reminding them that they're all getting duped. Stating the obvious that Cersei is quite the crazy bitch. Daenerys continues her wholesome act of sparing everyone instead of killing everyone by saying she will keep anyone alive who will bend the knee to her. <laughs> Unlike some people, with just a teensy bit of motivation from Viserya, nearly all the soldiers bend the knee except for Randall Tarly and his son. <coughs> Sorry, need a minute. Dickon Tarly. Despite some very hasty counsel from Tyrion, Daenerys sentences them all to death. Before becoming baby back ribs, Randall Tarly berates Tyrion for killing his father. And just like that, it's barbecue time. Now I knew I was gonna hate Randall Tarly from the moment I met him last season. And while this was a very gratifying death for Randall and his dick, on. It sucks we couldn't get more conflict between Sam and his father, especially after all the buildup last season and Sam stealing his father's Valerian steel sword. Still, this is Throne of Games, just desserts were still had, that's all we can say. Jamie heads to Cersei's chamber where he reports of their loss at Highgarden. Cersei of course continues her crazy rampage, until Jamie shuts her up by telling her about Olena's confession that she killed Joffrey. Cersei denies it, but Jamie reminds her just how much of a bitch Olena really was and convinces her that she was telling the truth. Jamie continues to pound Cersei but this time instead of his peanuts, it's him trying to convince her to surrender. Unfortunately, the Mad Queen demands that the armies keep fighting. Jon stands on the cliffside of Dragonstone awaiting Daenerys' return. High in the sky, he sees her riding Drogon this time? The dragon color is different, that's all I noticed. After a wicked shot of dragon standing in front of Jon looking like something out of Skyrim, we get a very emotional, almost orgasmic reaction from Jon as he takes off his glove to pet dragon on the side of the cheek. More than likely dragon allowed Jon to touch him because he could sense his Targaryen blood. Really glad they finally put something in in regards to Jon's ties to the Targaryen family. Jorah arrives with a Dothraki escort revealing he was able to find a cure. Daenerys must have spent quite a long time away from home, seeing as the Citadel and Dragonstone are literally on different sides of the country. I did never really care for how time works in this show, but this was something I noticed hardcore. Still, it's no different from Littlefinger's ability to teleport. At Winterfell, Brands and Godmo scouting out the army of the dead as they're getting closer to what appears to be the edge of the wall. The Night King spooks his raven scouts off, and Bran orders the maester to send ravens out to assumably all the kingdoms of Westeros that the army of the dead is coming. The Citadel is the first to get Bran's message, but of course they deny it. But Sam's in the room and hears them talking about it, and he backs up Brandon's claim. Unfortunately, Archmaester Butterman and his little council just mock the warning and dismiss Sam whilst talking about the death of his father and brother behind his back. Can't say Sam will be that heartbroken when he hears about it, but this show's full of surprises. Varys is nervously tapping what I can only assume is his copy of Bran's warning, whilst he and Tyrion chug wine and discuss the repercussions of Daenerys' execution earlier. Varys mentions the close relation to her father, the Mad King. She's a Targaryen, what do you expect? They like burning people. Before the topic changes to Tyrion's advisor status and how he could could possibly get Daenerys to listen to him. Nothing really comes out of it when we cut to Jon receiving the scroll from Varys. Barely a smile, actually none at all, when he finds out his little sister Arya and crippled brother Bran are still alive. Instead addressing how Bran could possibly know of the Night King's march on the wall, which at this point Jon thought only he and his men only knew about it. They end up arguing how Cersei won't believe that this army of the dead even exists, and that all she's gonna be focusing on is that sweet domination over all of Westeros, until Tyrion brings up the crazy idea of bringing something in relation relation to the White Walkers to King's Landing to show Cersei. A living white or moving skeleton, for example. The plan turns into John will lead a raid of a few good men beyond the wall. Jorah included. I'd just like to say, 
Huge landslide. I did not see this coming for the story. Lots of tension as this crazy idea begins to brew. Tyrion says if he can sneak to King's Landing, he can talk to his brother who could inevitably talk to Cersei about this. Daenerys refuses to let Jon go, getting everybody thinking that she's actually gonna hold him as a hostage. But Jon still retains his king status and asks her to trust a stranger. Then and only then does she allow it. I feel like subconsciously she knows they're related. This of course continues the theme of Jon's hidden identity throughout the episode. Patience is dwindling at Winterfell due to Jon's absence. Sansa continues to hold her ground on Jon's leadership, but it doesn't sit too well with her people. After a meeting, Sansa and Arya walk and talk. And can I just add, I love that these two are back together again. One thing I was always waiting for this show was seeing these two together after they've matured and all the shit that they've been through. It's still hard to believe it's been six years and this shit's already almost done. As Sansa retains her faith in Jon, Arya becomes a cute little sociopath and attempts to seduce Sansa into the idea of taking over. Sansa dismisses it, but we can all see it in her eyes. Arya points it out too that she is most definitely thinking it. A look of terror washes over Sansa as she sees what her sister has truly become. Based on how Arya was talking about her half-brother, this has got me worried about the relationship between Jon and Arya. Tyrion and Davos arrive at King's Landing with the intent of smuggling Tyrion in to see his brother. Turns out Davos has some business to take care of himself as he makes his way to Flea Bottom. We cut to what I think is Kyburn's chamber. As Bronn brings Jaime to Tyrion hiding in the shadows. Jaime we didn't get to see the reunion between Tyrion and his favorite sellsword friend, but let's be honest, it probably wasn't touching and probably went something like, Braun. It's good to see you, friend. Oh, fuck off. We then have a very heartwarming scene between brothers, as Tyrion gets all emotional, probably having not seen his brother for a good year or two. Jaime shuts him up before the tears start flowing and tells him to get to the point. Before Tyrion says anything, we cut to Davos and Flea Bottom. As he comes across the greatest rower the world has ever known. <laughs> I said the rowing thing, you happy now? You know, I thought, for several months after we last saw Gendry, of where he could possibly go. He's a wanted man all over Westeros. He definitely wouldn't survive on the east side of the world, even if he's a grand master on that boat. So why not go back to where he started? Great twist. Gendry departs with Davos, but not before he grabs his family heirloom. I really hope that's Robert's actual hammer and not some kind of homage Gendry made. Regardless, Gendry puts it to good use on the beach in a classic Chekhov's gun situation. You know, the thing where a gun is being shown on screen and you can count on that gun being fired? Same thing with Robert's hammer. Let's just say, two gold cloaks. <laughs> Pancakes. Jamie goes to Cersei to talk about what Tyrion had told him, but she shows off Kyburn's ability to put Varys's little birds to good use. When she admits she knows Tyrion was in King's Landing and Brom was the one who took Jamie to him. Apparently Cersei let it happen to help gain Daenerys's trust? I was a bit weirded out about how quiet and eerily happy Cersei was this whole time, and my suspicions were confirmed when it turns out she's pregnant. I happen to know that there's a little Lannister on the way. Davos introduces Gendry to Jon, reminding Gendry to keep his identity a secret. But knowing Gendry like Arya did, even if she didn't go all the way, he blurts out his name so the whole mine can hear, bringing the houses of Baratheon and Stark together once again. We get yet another tender moment as Gendry and Jon reminisce about their fathers. Lots of nostalgia this season. With a smile and a handshake, Jon welcomes Gendry to the fold, deciding in fact he could be valuable on their trek beyond the wall, throwing in yet another entree for the White Walker's meal. We have the Jorah Supreme, the Jon Grand Slam, why not add the Gendry Buffet? Someone's gonna die, aren't they? As the crew prepares to depart, we get more wacky friend zoning between Danny and Jorah. I should also mention our beloved Mother of Dragons gives our favorite King of the North a very wicked, almost DTF gaze as he pushes the boat away. I won't think of it much this time as we cut to the Citadel, where Gilly is reading very trivial lines to a very cranky Sam. Sam rants off how the Maesters won't listen to him about Bran's note, before storming off to the restricted section snagging as many books as he can, once again stealing valuable property that doesn't belong to him, and once more running off with Gilly and Sam Jr. We gonna go three for three next season? What's next? Sam steals all the dragon glass from John and goes off to fight the White Walker army on his own? It was just one rehash, I'm sure it was calculated. A devious game of cat and mouse is being played as Arya stalks Littlefinger roaming through Winterfell. She witnesses him bribing a maid of some sort and talking to a group of northern leaders. Littlefinger gets a document of some kind from the local maester and Arya sees him lock it in his bedroom. Arya shows off her level 99 lockpicking skills when she breaks into the bedroom and finds out the note was regarding 
concerning John's resurrection and an alleged conspiracy for him to become King of the North. Please go easy if I read that wrong, I didn't read the whole note in time. Arya takes off, leaving it ambiguous as to whether or not she took the note with her. As it turns out, this is a game of cat versus cat as Littlefinger watches her depart from afar. John and crew arrive at Eastwatch at the edge of the wall and meet up with our favorite ginger caveman, Tormund Giantsbane. After asking about his girlfriend, Tormund introduces John and the group to Beric and the Hound, whom turns out Tormund took as hostile and locked him up in a cell. We get a big I'm more manlier than you competition, everyone's a dick to each other, till the Hound does a great impersonation of the audience at this point and tells everyone to shut up and just get on with the adventure. Of course this works as we get badass shots of everyone putting on their best Christmas sweater outfits, and they all march through the gate beyond the wall. All for what is basically an episode of Pokemon with the whole taking one of these things alive. White Walker, Night King, White, gotta catch them all. Now like I said, this episode was fantastic for the amount of answers that we got. Things are really starting to wrap up at a great pace and I'm starting to get more excited by the minute. Unfortunately, I'm also getting a bit worried. Those were quite a few main characters we had leaving beyond the wall. We haven't had a real big death in quite a while. And yes, no, obviously the last one doesn't count. But still, the pacing in this one was spectacular even if it was 58 minutes long. Lots of build up to some very successful climaxes if they play their cards right. We've got Arya and Littlefinger who seem to begin to get at each other's throats. More than likely fighting for Sansa's trust and or affection. Sam breaking his vows once more and abandoning his duties as an amateur maester. And let's not forget the little blondie we've got coming our way. Gendry is back and fighting on the right side for once. And a bunch of bearded men on their way to a Grateful Dead concert. Shit, sorry, misread the prompter. Um, off to kidnap a zombie. Did I really just say that? Anyway, holy shit, this was well worth the time it took to get all the time in this new information digested. Now, as for next week, I know in the even-numbered seasons of the series, the ninth or let's say the penultimate episode of the season Season. The action is all primed in one location. Season 2, Battle of Blackwater. Season 4, The Attack on Castle Black. Season 6, Battle of the Bastards. So since this is an odd season, we'd expect it to be a normal-ish episode next week. I'm starting to put my money on it, mostly primarily being focused on this trek beyond the wall. Seeing as it was a huge focus in the trailer, a lot could go down. And methinks I spoke too soon when I mentioned that we haven't had a major character death in a while. Even if that happens, or whatever may come of these cliffhangers this week, I'll stomach it enough just so I can talk about it with you guys. As always, thanks for watching, and also, as always, you know what's coming at you. My name is Matt, and I am no longer rowing my boat in the middle of the ocean. See ya!